It's been good to be in church today, hasn't it? A lot of things going on, and I know we have a few people who are ill, and they're not able to, to make it here, and so we're keeping them in our thoughts and our prayers as well. Um, the, the sermon's being recorded right now for, um, for the future, but the, the service itself was not, was not recorded. And so I'd like to invite your attention back to Matthew chapter 28, which we started the service. Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 20. As um, we're going back to our series, and and I'm reminding you of the series that that we we started several weeks ago. It just seems like I still have about three more sermons out of that. And I might be able to squeeze a couple more out. But um, we've already looked at the importance of, of strengthening the disciples in the following areas. We remember when the Apostle Paul and his partners traveled to the churches, they didn't just simply travel for the sake of seeing them. They traveled with the purpose of strengthening them. Um, churches need to meet on purpose. They meet, need to meet for purpose. That's what makes a vital church. That's what makes a, a dynamic, growing church is when they understand that that they're here because of a calling that they have in their lives. And so we've been looking at biblical teaching is paramount to all that, Um, uh, showing up. Um, I've encouraged many of you, if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, you do have the spiritual gift of showing up. (laughs) Uh, Participation in the church is very, very important. And then we looked at Christian love, and, and then we looked at uh, holiness and personal holiness, our calling and also our, our position and our practical sanctification and holiness as God's word and describes. We looked at faithfulness as something that's, that we um, see modeled before us and in, in the people around us and also um, through scriptural examples. And then we talked about the importance of walking in the spirit and stewardship and giving, the importance of being doctrinally sound. Um, and we talked about the, the, the doctrinal soundness comes from biblical inspiration. And we talked about the application that we have and we can understand that the Bible it can be understood because of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. It's without error. And so we called it the inerrancy of Scripture. And we, we, we dwelt on that for a little while. And then we talked about the, the whole focus of what the church is. This is the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. And we talked about his person, his work on Calvary. We talked about his, 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 um, that the, he's our great high priest. He intercedes for you and me. What a blessing that is. And we know that we can come boldly to that throne because it's a throne of grace. And then last week, we looked at the issue of sin and how it relates to salvation. You don't need salvation if you don't understand sin. And so um, you can't repent of something you don't understand. So we we talked about sin. That was a a sermon that that is very um, important for the church to understand. That's why we don't capitulate to a social gospel of just cleaning up the outside of a society that, that we go to the very heart of the matter because that's where Jesus went to. And so he used terms like being born again. And so today we're going to focus our attention to some very practical areas that are, cent- that are a central part of our faith in Jesus Christ. Um, in addition to what we should believe, we're going to talk about some things that we're to practice. Well, here's what Christians believe and here's what Christians Do And I've often said that when you come to church, um, a person should be able to to enter into this building and say, ah, that's what Christians do. (laughs) I get it now. I I see what they do. I I, I may not agree with it. In fact, they probably won't. I may not be comfortable around it, but I know one thing. They love me. And I know one thing. They're accepting me and they've got a message for me. And so the, the things that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks are found in this particular verse in verse number 19. Excuse me, in verse number 20. But it starts in, in Matthew 28 and verses 18, 19, and 20. I'll read it again. We started our service with this. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, he's speaking to his disciples. Okay, he's risen from the dead. He's about to ascend back to his father. Okay, they're convinced. 
However, they're, they're doubting. They're convinced of who he said he was, but they don't know what the future is going to be. So here's what Jesus says. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And here's where I'm getting my theme for the next three weeks. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And he gives us a wonderful promise here. He says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, even to the end of this dispensation that we're, that we're under right now. And so the, the writer here, Matthew, adds, amen. You know what amen means? I agree. I agree. And so um, in, if you have a red-lettered edition, Bible, usually the red letters, this course an editor does this, says that those are the words of Jesus. Jesus didn't speak red letters. This, okay. And then the, the amen is we agree to it. That's a powerful statement. Because he has said here that he, the purpose of the church is to teach believers what they are to observe. To observe something means it becomes your practice. So Jesus Christ has given his followers, that is you and me, some definite instructions on what we are to be actually occupying ourselves with. We will deal with three in particular um, today. Um, um, today we're just going to deal with one, but there are three in particular. Evangelism, which is today, and it will be a, a message that that you'll probably all understand quite easily. It's not a difficult message to understand. And, and then we're going to talk about worship. That's the thing that we need to observe. We come together to worship. We'll talk about that next week. And then we're going to spend another couple of weeks talking about the ordinances of the church, which, of course, is the Lord's Supper and baptism, the importance of those aspects. The attention of our outline today, of course, will be... Um, those three elements of evangelism. Of course, everything's in threes. It makes it easier for me to understand and, and, to, and to establish before you. So when Jesus said that all his converts were to observe things, he means that you and I are to obey certain things, perform certain things that he commanded for us. And that's why we do Bible teaching. Um, that's why we don't just give self-help talks and all this, and, and we enjoy each other's company and all this, but actually, we're here to find out what he has for us to do. So for the next few minutes, we're going to consider the Great Commission itself. Of course, you say, well, why didn't you wait till next month to do this? Isn't next month Missions Month? Look, every Sunday is Mission Sunday around here. Next month, I'm going to give you some mechanics on how to do different things. We'll be having some mission reports, and we'll probably have an, an international potluck. Yeah, that brought some smiles, yeah. And, we, and then we're probably going to have a men's breakfast. We're going to have it on the day that Reuters cleaning the church. Yes, and uh, we've already discussed that. And, uh, and we're going to be doing some really great things together. But, but I want you to understand, it actually starts here. It starts in this passage right now. It's known as the Great Commission. In many churches today, it's the <clears throat> Great Omission. But it shouldn't be. There's two other passages I'd like to, to, um, to read for you right now, and they're found in the book of Mark, chapter 16. You may or may not have time to turn to it, but just jot it down. There's two other tests which restate what Matthew has recorded here. Same sort of scenario, stated in a different way. And he said unto them, Mark, in his gospel says, and he said unto them, Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In other words, judged. It's a very, very emphatic, powerful statement to make. If sometimes what you can do is you, is you take a, 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 a teaching or a method and you Bring it down to one statement. And in this statement here, Mark says in most concise things what we're to be doing and the reason why we're to be doing it. There is a judgment to come. 
There, there, there really is a time of reckoning. And we Christians understand that. We've received Jesus as our Savior. Now we go out and we share that message with others. Luke brings it up as well in Luke 24, in verses 45 and 48. And when Luke is um, bringing his gospel to a conclusion, he says here uh, what Jesus was doing. In fact, I'm going to turn to that passage because it's a, it's a, it's a powerful context. I'd like you to see real quickly. This isn't um, part of my sermon notes, but I tend to do things like this. It says in, um, in Luke chapter 24, if you look at the context, he's proving that he's there in front of them in his resurrected body. Okay, this is powerful. He says in verse 39, uh, by the way, they're troubled by this. They're concerned. Wouldn't you be? You know, we often think of these disciples, early disciples, as being super people. You know, they, they had all the power. They had, no, they were people just like you and me who had walked with Jesus Christ and they saw the risen Christ and it changed their life forever. And now they're concerned. What is this going to mean for me? Look at verse number 39. He simply says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Look at verse 41. And while they believed not for joy and wonder, he said, I'm hungry. He says, have you any meat? And basically what it means there is, is they were absolutely in a state of shock and unbelief and very happy about it. They just couldn't believe what they saw. What is this going to mean for us in the future? And so, so while he's eating, he's letting them think about this. And I, I just love the context of what Luke says here. Verse 42, and he gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took it, and he did eat before them, and he said unto them. So while he is there proving that he's risen from the dead in reality, he's not just teaching them some, 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 some truths that they have to to believe without seeing the evidence. He's the evidence right before them. He says to them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. While all these things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. He says the whole Old Testament is, a, is, is directing the attention of the readers to me. We were talking about the law before. Um, Dennis brought it up the, that the, the Jews um, um, bring in their calendar with the giving of the law. Of course, we Christians say we call it the year of our Lord, of course, because he came to fulfill the law. And this, this verse shows that. He says, you look in the Old Testament and you see this. Now look at verse 45. And he opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And what did the scriptures say? Verse 46. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And here's that commission. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And he tells them to wait there in Jerusalem until they get the power of the Holy Spirit and then go forth. What he is, people today are looking for answers. People today, they may not be able to articulate it or say, but they're looking for a reason to have hope. This year has been a very difficult year. And we've, we've seen people always, they're, they're hanging out for hope for something. And you know, whether it's a vaccine or whether it's eradication or whether, whatever it is, they're holding out hope. It's same in these days here. People were looking how can I have a relationship with God? How in the world can I know and understand and have the confidence that I'm accepted by God? There are a number of people who are going around there, a number of false messiahs that were doing that. He says, you have two things. You've got the understanding of the scriptures and you've got me in front of you with eating honeycomb and fish. You saw me dead. I've risen from the dead. You've got the scriptures that support it. Now take that message out and proclaim it to the world. 
That's the great commission. You're witnesses of these things. This great commission was given to us to be a functioning church. Not just a church that, that, that just, you know, we're, our names are on a roll somewhere. No, it's a functioning church. We all have different gifts. We all have different measures of faith in this great effort. But the Great Commission is your commission. And it's my commission. Collectively, as a church, it's for all of us to do. It's our calling. And we're charged with proclaiming and living the gospel message so that people will get it, so that people will understand and accept it. Um, we become active followers of Jesus Christ, not just um, adherents or spectators from some philo uh, philological or, or, or from some ethical point of view. No, no, we are not just following Christ. We believe that Christ is in us. We've accepted him as our personal savior. There's three essential elements if you're going to proclaim the gospel. And I, I'm running out of time here already, but I'm just going to share them with you briefly because this is so important. Number one is we share a gospel that converts people. So it's conversion. We're born again. We're saved. We're not talking about turning over a new leaf. We're not talking about cleaning up your life. We're talking about a rebirth. This gospel that he has proclaimed that he has commissioned us to proclaim is a life-changing gospel because it is, in fact, a new life. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said that if we're in Christ, we are new creations. We're new creatures in Christ. Number two is, it's a gospel that we proclaim, and, and I'm getting all this from Matthew chapter number 28 in verses number 19. It's also a gospel that, um, of identification, and so we baptize converts. And baptism, we'll be talking about that more in a couple weeks. But baptism is identification with the gospel of Jesus Christ and with his church. And we'll give you examples about that. It's also a gospel that needs instruction. Three different elements of this great commission. This instruction here, he says, teach all nations. To uh, teaching them, verse 20, uh, to observe all things whatsoever command. That is something that is going to happen day in and day out until the Lord comes back because we're always needing to learn. We need to grow in knowledge and in service. Other ways of expressing these three elements would be this way. And this is, this is something very important to listen to. We are commissioned to call people to be taken out of the world system. I'll let that sit for a minute. In other words, the world is in sin and condemnation. And God's given us a commission to call people out of sin and condemnation. And he's done that through the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul, once again, to the Corinthians says, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And we all have burdens for lost loved ones. We have burdens for people that we care about. And, and we, so what do we do? We share the gospel with them. We, we don't want to convert them to a, an ideology. We want to introduce them to the living Savior, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And then the second thing that this gospel does for us, and, and we show this through baptism, and in fact, what we were discussing this morning with church membership, being part of the family, as it were, is we place them into a church relationship um, in other words a church relationship is a relationship that challenges us to be transformed into the image of christ church should always be just a little bit uncomfortable just a little bit motivating a little bit um, um, to the place where where we're being um, shown how we're to do worship properly where we are having fellowship together based on our spiritual heritage. So we have spiritual fellowship. And when we have instruction, we have instruction from the Word of God because the Word of God, of course, is profitable for our lives. And, that, and the whole reason why we do that is so that we can grow spiritually. That's what church is all about. 
Um, that's why we're doing what we're doing in our first hour with the adult class when we talk about the marks of a mighty church. We're talking about what it means to be not just um, uh, uh, going to church, but to be a part of God's church. This is the commission that he gave us. Imagine sitting there that day in your doubt, in your wonderment. You read Mark. It says in, in Mark, in the same place, it says there that, that many of them um, were, were afraid and they doubted. So Jesus doesn't rail on them. He points them to him. And he says, all power is given unto me. Look at verse 17. You're in Matthew 28. Look at the last three words before Jesus gave him the commission. He didn't wait for them to be ready. It says here, but when they saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. You know, there may be some sitting here right now who are saying, you know, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. I see the evidence. I understand that, but... But I, I just don't know. I don't know about this thing about, about going, walking with the Lord. And the Lord doesn't say, well, you know, just, just pick it up and, and, and do your best. No, he says, um, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go. He says, I will go with you. Number one is the conversion of people. We are to make converts. In Acts chapter 1, I'm going to, to move through this quickly um, for some of you who already have the notes there. I'm going to jump down a little bit here. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, he tells us that ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. This church of Jesus Christ with this great commission is not doing things through their programs and through their, their own abilities. It's the power of God working in your life. He says that you will receive power and you will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He's talking to people. Some of them had never been out of their town. And they've been told that you're going to have a part in a commission that's going to take you around the world. In Acts chapter 5 and verse number 42, it talked about how that looked. And it says, and daily in the temple, in every house, what did they do? They cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. So in order to be involved in this commission that you and I have been called to do, we need to be versatile. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. We, we, we shouldn't just have our own program and, and say, this is what I'm going to do in my life. Lord, would you please bless it? Enable me to live my life because it's all about me. No, we need to be versatile and allow the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us in the way that he wants us to be a witness for him. In Jude, it says it this way, in verses 22 to 23, and it says, Of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment, that is spotted by the flesh. As you're dealing with different, and I, I realize some of you have, have lo loved ones that you've been praying for for years and years, and you're witnessing to them. That is the great commission in your life. Continue to pray for them. Continue to be a witness to them. Be versatile. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to work in you and to, and to do that. And the, the second thing we talked about was baptism. Like I said, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll really get into it. But Jesus made this a part of the Great Commission simply because, and, and today we're talking about evangelism, it's a part of our commission. But what is scriptural baptism? Scriptural baptism is the immersion in water of a person who has accepted Jesus as their Savior. It doesn't cause you to be saved. It is a statement or an expression of what has occurred in your life. You are now in Christ. It has been noted in scriptural, that scriptural baptism is an outward picture of an inward reality. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in our life. Notice I've been using the frame, or I use the phrase, a scriptural baptism. And we'll get that deeper in another sermon. But it's, it's not scriptural, in other words, in the Bible, to, to baptize babies. 
for example, or, or, to, or to baptize in order to be saved. That's not scriptural, so we call it scriptural baptism. And some of you um, were baptized as a little baby, and, um, and that's what your church taught and all this. And now you're coming to the understanding that, that the Great Commission said that converts are baptized. And um, we'll, we'll look into that. That's a, a tremendous thing to understand that because there's a lot of false teaching a misunderstanding about that. And since Jesus Christ commanded it to be done, and we see in history the early churches performed it, in fact, when I was over in, in Israel many years ago, um, we, we saw the, the early baptistries, and they, they, were all, they were all tanks. Not quite as big as our tank, but they were, they were all tanks, and they, they were done, and people were immersed and all that. It was very interesting to see that. And Jerusalem church participated in this baptism. I'm going to just read one verse for you and let it stand where it is. In Acts chapter 2, in, um, verse number 36, he preaches the gospel to him. He says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, Peter's preaching here, that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here's what Peter said to them in verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why was Peter doing that? Because he was practicing the Great Commission. He says, and, and for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is to you and to your house and to all that are far off. And so um, verse 41 says, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. They gave forth that wonderful identification of who they were in Christ. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, don't wait for two weeks from now for where I really explain what baptism is. Um, obey that commission and follow him in scriptural baptism and, um, and, and make that statement before other believers. And it says here, and on the same day they were added to them 3,000 souls. Those apostles had sore arms that the, the day after, didn't they? After all that baptizing. But they, and then what did they do? It says here in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread and prayers. Church, uh, their lives changed. Church, fellowship, commission, evangelism became their central focus. And then finally, in the church relationship, as, as we instruct converts, the church is about that. It's, it's a gospel-proclaiming, Bible-believing church is your training ground to be a Christ follower. This is where you get to practice what is preached. This is where we get to experiment with each other. We get to, we get to live in this wonderful place where, where our gifts can be exercised, where we can learn what it means to be loved, accepted, forgiven, edified, where we can learn to, to discover and develop our spiritual gifts in a place that is going to be encouraging for us to do it. Uh, it's when the church gathers in congregation that we actually come together to worship the Lord. Um, it's an amazing thing. You and I are worshiping creatures, and we worship the Lord all throughout the week, and then we come together, and boy, weren't the songs powerful today, and we lifted up our voices together. What were we doing? We were the gathered church, and we were doing what, he had, what we've been told to do as we are observing what he has taught us. In a functioning church, we learn how to walk with God, not with the world. We, we learn what it means to grow in grace, mature in the faith. We learn what it means to serve God. Every missionary that our church supports are members of a local assembly. And every single one, I've heard all their testimonies. I've sat down, had meals with all of them and, and, and talked with them about this. And every single one of them have an illustration of they were sitting there and God called them out there. The Great Commission. This phrase, the Great Commission, is performed in this church. That is my prayer. That is my burden. 
That is my life, and it's your life as well. We have people who have been members of this church for many, many years, and they do not grow weary in well-doing because they're constantly reminded of what the church is about. It's a church that's a covenant community. By that, I mean that we are here in agreement. We've, we've made agreements with one another. We, um, we're identified. We are accountable, and we are structured. That's the, the material of the Great Commission. Let's all stand together. We're going to be singing a final hymn here. I've, I've kept you a little bit longer um, because we've had some other activities that we're doing um, earlier in the service, and I thank you for your patience. But let me just close with, with this thought for you as we go to our Lord in prayer. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a message of evangelism. It's a message that needs to be proclaimed. We look through the Bible and the book of Acts and we see illustration after illustration of this, the people going out and they're spreading the news. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, let me tell you, somebody loves you and they're concerned about you and they're praying for you. They've got a wonderful message because they've stood, as it were, before a Savior who has said, I have risen. And they said, we've accepted you as our Savior. And then that Savior has told them to go and tell other people. And they're telling you because they love you. And they want to see you have a relationship with God like they do. And you may, may be saying, just like some of those disciples, I'm doubting. Um, I don't get it. Um, I, I'm here. Jesus says, I can handle your doubts. I can handle your anguish. I can handle your fear. I can handle all your, uh, your, your other beliefs. Just give them to me and let me open up your eyes of understanding. That's exactly what he did with the first century, and he's doing it for the likes of you and me today in the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your word today, and we know that as Jesus Christ has all power in heaven and earth, that he has commissioned us to not only make converts, but also to baptize him and to be faithful in teaching them, to fellowship together, to be a part of this church, Lord, is such a privilege. And Lord, we pray that you will lift up men and women in this congregation that I'm praying with right now to do your work of the ministry. And we praise you, Lord, for those who have risen up and they're doing just that. We pray that you will empower them, Lord. Lord, that they have the burden now, Lord. Um, show them and, and, and help them through their gifts, Lord to be able to, to, to take that burden and that passion and to use it to be an effective witness of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brother Dennis, would you come and lead us in the closing song, please?